I have two questions this week. Question one, why should we put up with the pain predicted in our future by the same people who made it inevitable? And question two, how quickly do they think we forget what only just happened? First, the pain. Rishi Sunak conjured up and blew away a mountain of money, hundreds of billions of pounds worth of the funny, all but fraudulent money that is the gift only of the private bankers who have him and every other Western leader in their pocket. Now he's got an even bigger job than before and gets to tell us we'll have to endure tough times ahead, real pain. That's real pain for us proles, of course, and champagne for him and his pals. All of this mess is of his creation, him and his pinstriped cronies. And yet we who did nothing wrong are the patsies handed the bill. I've quoted the outlaw Josie Wales before on here, but time and again I find the same words going round and round in my head. Don't pee down my back and tell me it's raining. The same characters, those that clapped and cheered on both sides of the chamber as the disastrous lockdown measures were put in place, are still clumped around him with shiny new jobs, or at least their old jobs, and every bit as pointless as they were before. None of them has added so much as a jot to their store of wisdom. They've learned nothing, except, of course, the priceless knowledge relevant only to senior MPs, that if you just brass it out in the face of the most monumental cock-up of your career, it turns out you can pretty much get away with murder. We can see this. In fact, our noses are rubbed in the reality of it daily. Every time we have to look at the same old faces, unrepentant, blind and deaf to any notion that there might be confessions required, responsibility taken for the most inexcusable mistakes, grovelling apologies offered for unimaginable damage done, hurts inflicted that cannot and will not heal. They should be in exile on Elba, the sorry lot of them, and yet there they are, business as usual, and telling us the bill is past due. Of course the bill is past due, the gormless fools. It was them that ran it up in the first place, while some of us, some of us, looked on in horror at the truck crash happening in slow motion. But remember at all times that it's not Covid's fault we're flat broke, or Putin's fault, or the climate's fault. You can't blame the rain if you get soaked. The rain is inevitable. You get soaked because you gave away your coat and you didn't buy an umbrella. We're getting soaked, drowning, because of two years in which the establishment shut down the country and the economy. We're out in the cold because of a decade and more of destructive energy policies that mean we have none of our own and have to go cap in hand to others to keep the lights on. The fault is theirs, our political class and their masters, those that designed, choreographed and executed the plan. The fact we're in the deepest financial hole ever dug is down to those that shut us in our homes, or tried to, and then conjured up unimaginable sums of money that didn't exist and sprayed it all over the floor, up the walls and down the drains. Sunak and his ilk paid people, not all people of course, but millions of people to stay at home when they could and should have been out earning and keeping the economy going. Those deemed unworthy of help watched the businesses they couldn't attend to going bust and lost everything. Those usual suspects threw billions into the pointless, ineffectual money pit of track and trace. They blew billions more on useless and unused PPE and on gazillions of masks that made no difference other than to stoke the fear of millions of men, women and children and litter the countryside and choke the oceans. They coerced millions into taking medical products that, as time has told, didn't work as advertised. Nonetheless, they nudged and pushed and finally bullied and threatened the majority of people into putting themselves under the needle, not once but several times. Now their propagandists are out and about again, pushing the same old drugs with an influenza chaser just for good measure. If it wasn't so coldly calculated, you'd have to say it was insane. As far as I'm concerned, it should be described as criminally insane. Hundreds of billions of pounds wasted, all part of the greatest transfer of wealth to the already rich in the history of the world. To my mind, it's not and never was any sort of accident that dumped us here, soaked to the skin and freezing. Too many of the same mistakes were made by too many of the same people to the same effect. Too many people, all reading from the same script. To take but a couple of examples at random, EU overlord Ursula von der Leyen blew 71 billion euros buying the so-called vaccines. Enough of the dope to give every man, woman and child in the EU 10 doses. 10 more pain for more people. And across the pond, adult President Biden, yet to take back so much as a syllable of his nonsense about safe and effective, has more recently overseen the destruction of America's once limitless domestic energy supply to such an extent that his nation has just 20 odd days of diesel left. That means in less than a month, trains, buses and private cars 
not to mention the trucks that move all the food and other necessities around the entire country, could grind to a halt and, with them, the entire US economy. Why is America committing suicide, ceasing to be what most of us even recognise as America? That's a question for another day. And now to add insult to all the injury, and let's not forget the millions of adverse effects suffered around the world, the deaths attributed to the jabs, we have to listen to the architects of our imminent financial misery and demise, telling us we just have to endure the pain, the pain they knowingly caused are continuing to cause and that they're manoeuvring to make even worse. In Egypt, at COP27, the UN's annual conference for climate change bedwetters, the agenda is stuffed with plans to eviscerate farming around the world. Against a backdrop of manufactured fear about how cows are destroying the planet by burping and how the fertilisers that have enabled us to feed the billions now promise only doom and gloom on a global scale, they talk about cutting farming here, there and everywhere by as much as half. Let's all pay attention. We're talking here about the very stuff of life upon which every soul depends. From the same deranged ideologues who have ensured energy insecurity comes global food insecurity. All across the developed world, farmers and their supporters, which in truth should be everyone who has even vague plans to still be eating actual, real, fresh food in the years to come, are protesting in ever-growing numbers. Do we see this defiance reported on the news? Do we hear those farmers given airtime to explain the folly of what the bureaucrats have planned? No, we do not. The decisions affecting all their lives in every conceivable way about food and money and round-the-clock surveillance continue to be discussed and made by unelected, unaccountable advocates of one world government. Over and over, we're told the world is coming to an end on account of climate change that's all humankind's fault. And yet the measures being contemplated at COP27 will surely mean the end anyway for hundreds of millions, billions of people driven into the cold and bony arms of starvation, disease, war and death by suicidal policies born of vanity, hubris and the pursuit of yet more wealth by the few for the few. All of which brings me back to my second question about the apparently misfiring memories of those desperate, utterly desperate to pretend the last two years never happened, or if they did happen, that they happened altogether differently than I remember. George Orwell wrote about memory holing in his novel 1984, the process by which information that no longer helps the official narrative is made to disappear as if it had never existed. Just as a for instance, they're trying to tell us now that no one ever said the so-called vaccines would prevent the spread of COVID from person to person. They damn well did say that, over and over again. That was the entire basis for the granny killer selfish covid abuse directed at those of us who never did and never will submit to those jabs. To claim now that such claims were never made is the most blatant and shameless of lies, damned lies, and yet it's pushed now by politicians, medical professionals and mainstream media alike. It can only be a matter of time, presumably when the numbers of vaccine dead and injured simply get too terrifyingly big to ignore, before the same characters are saying the jabs were voluntary anyway, and that it was always and only a matter of personal choice whether you took them or not. Don't come crying to me, they'll say in unison. In Orwell's novel of a dystopian future, the totalitarian government of Oceania was constantly at war with one of the other two totalitarian superpowers that dominated the world, Eurasia and East Asia. It wasn't about ever winning or ending the war, but rather maintaining a constant state of war in order to keep the citizens under control. Every citizen had to memory hold what each knew to be true and just accept the latest version of reality. Orwell called this doublethink, quote, to know and not to know, he wrote to be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies, to forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into the memory again at the moment it was needed. This is where we are now, listening to those who know the truth telling carefully constructed lies. Worse still, we are supposed to lie to each other and to ourselves about what just happened. We're expected to forget that those promising to fix the disaster are the same people that caused the disaster. We're supposed to forget that the MPs, medics and media told us we had to surrender our rights, our livelihoods, let loved ones die alone on account of a disease only a minuscule percentage of the population was ever at serious risk from, and they knew it, and yet were expected to believe instead that they never said any such thing. Soon enough we might be expected to forget that we ever used to pay in cash, and that our transactions were once our own private business, and accept instead digital IDs and central bank digital currencies and social credit scores. 
In a year or two, it might be as though there was never cash or privacy or dissent or protest. We'll be expected to forget. If we're already expected to forget how all this mess happened, then in a year or two we might be expected to forget we were ever sovereign individuals with private lives and private thoughts. But here's the thing. I, for one, won't be forgetting any of it. I remember everything. What's been done stays done. What's been said stays said. It's up to us to remember, to remember everything that happened and to keep reminding everyone else as well.